Thanks everyone for joining. Welcome to another episode of Paramel's Growth Roundtable. In case you haven't been part of this before, we just talk about growth. Uh, we've brought some very cool people here. I'm very excited to have Sean and Brian joining us. Um, but as per usual, I don't want to introduce them. I want them to do, introduce themselves. So why don't we get started with you, Sean, and give us some background about how you've gotten here and what you're working on. Hello, everybody. I'm Sean Burns. I've been a founder and CEO of companies for about 20 years now. Uh, that includes consumer businesses, um, some freemium uh, productivity tools, and my current company is a company called Outlier.ai, which is an enterprise software company. We use artificial intelligence to automate business analysis, and our customers are growth people at large consumer brands um, where they want to understand consumer behavior and how consumer behavior is shifting and how demographics are changing, and that's what we help them with at Outlier. Uh, I've invested in uh, countless dozens of companies and seen almost every kind of go-to-market strategy, every kind of growth strategy out there in the pros and cons. And I'm excited to share everything I've learned and frankly, all the things that I haven't learned, because let's be honest, nobody here has all the answers with everybody. This is true. Thanks a lot. And I remember you uh, calling me, I think the way we met is when you were doing product development for Outlier. And you called mm -hmm. me and you're like, here's what we're working on. And it was, yeah. Um, it's been really cool to see you guys scale over the last few years. Um, and uh, Brian, why don't you go next? Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Brian Cho. Um, I'm the one of the co-founders, CTO of uh, Webflow. And you might be wondering why the CTO is on the call or on the podcast today. Uh, but as of Maybe two, three years ago, I started transitioning my time over more into the go-to-market realm. So I um, worked on standing up our sales team, marketing teams. Uh, and then before Webflow, um, I, along with Sean, actually was also in the, the mobile app space. So I was a CTO of a company called Bungle. And... Um, have had a kind of a weird roundabout way to getting to, um, you know, kind of the role that I play now. Um, kind of started as an embedded systems engineer at Qualcomm and kind of went further and further up the stack uh, to the point now where I probably can't even write a line of C that I can compile. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's awesome to be here and interested and you know, just really keen on having uh, this discussion. That's awesome. I, I, I relate to that a lot because <laughs> I, I also was a programmer in, in my career and I was coding this thing with my brother in C++ and I couldn't get it to compile for like an hour. And it's just, it's, it's been so far away from me now. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, we, we were chatting before about how you guys have approached growth in general, I think that there is a very clear distinction between maybe outliers gone after customers, even from the early days until now versus maybe how Webflow has been doing it. Um, and, you mm -hmm. know, I, I thought we could start with why did you choose that path? I think that in itself should hopefully shed a lot of light on how you could be thinking about um, what types of sales motions or marketing motions you should be going after. Maybe Sean, you can get started. We can, we can always do this like, you know, Sean Bryant cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> so um, it, it's interesting because I think that the, your your motion, your go to market motion and how you sell on everything is a journey because you can't know out of the gate necessarily what the best motion will look like your customers. As you mentioned, Neem, I met you because we were doing research into what that might look like at Outlier. And if you my, my previous company before Outlier was a company called Flurry, which is a large analytics and, and ad platform for mobile apps. And even at Flurry, you know, we were starting the early days of mobile apps. It wasn't clear how do you reach mobile developers, right? Like what is a mobile developer and, and what do they need and how do you speak to them? And we had to learn those things. And at Outlier, you know, when I had, I had this idea for a tool that would, like I said, use artificial intelligence to analyze your data and bring you insights. Okay, well, that's great, but who do you sell it to and how do you sell it to them? And I had some theories. I'll give you an example of one that was totally wrong, which was, you know, the best customer for Outlier would be startup companies or small businesses because they can't afford to hire analysts and therefore we'll be the best, the virtual analyst for them. And we'll just do a direct model. I, like I use it Flurry, which is a freemium, you know, try it and then upsell. And that was a disaster. It was totally didn't work <laughs> because it turns out small businesses, they just don't have time to deal with these sorts of things. They're too busy just getting the business going. And it was through a period of iteration and selling and, and, 
interviewing customers and looking at what works that we ended up with what we have today, which is a more or less traditional enterprise sales model selling to executives of large businesses. But it wasn't clear at the beginning that was going to be the right model. And we kind of found that through iterative research. And I'll, one thing I'll emphasize, though, it's really important was it's really expensive to try to find that journey by doing, meaning like you don't want to hire a bunch of salespeople to figure out if enterprise selling works. You don't want to spend a few million dollars on, mm. on ads on Facebook to figure out if direct marketing works. Like it's very expensive to do it to see if it works. So the game is how do you try to test to see if it works before doing it for us? Um, like you mentioned, I met a lot of people. I wasn't even selling the product. I was just interviewing customers, trying to understand if this did exist, how would you evaluate it? How would you buy it? How do you learn about products? Where do you go? And it was, we saved ourselves a lot of time and money and were very cost effective by not trying to move to a motion until we had proven that it worked. And that was, it takes time, but time is a lot cheaper than money. And it's one thing you have plenty of as a founder. Yeah, it's, that's an interesting, this comes up a lot where, uh, so for context, I think I forgot to mention what I do. I, I run a paid growth studio where we help software companies scale through art and technology. And quite often founders come to us and say, you know, we've never spent a single dollar on any of these channels. Can you come and scale us up to $100,000 a month? And and it sounds like, oh yeah, of course we can do that for you. But really that's, that's a huge problem because you're just probably likely going to waste money because you probably don't know enough about your customer base alone to let us know what we can do. Um, and I think it's such a classic problem that I notice a lot when, when people come to us and I immediately reject those folks, obviously, and tell them, you know what, that's what you should be doing. Spend the first 20K yourself. It's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. uh, same with sales. Do, do the first few, few sales by yourself and figure out if it works, then hire someone that's going to do some SDR work or AE work for actually, you. I'm actually curious to ask Sean, like if you guys started out with developers that or startups that didn't have you know, budget to hire data analysts. Um, where where are you now in terms of ideal customer profile and what was the journey to get there? That's actually a great question. So it, it, our journey is slowly moved up the stack. So we went from the early stage startups um, to later stage businesses to eventually pre-IPO companies, businesses like, well, they were pre-IPO at the time, businesses like the real, real Poshmark who went, it went public last week, GoodRx, it went public a year ago. And then from there, what we found was the larger we were going, the more success we were having. And so then today, you know, our customers include some of the biggest Fortune 500 businesses like Capital and uh, those sorts of businesses. And so I, what I was finding was this, this return, which is the bigger we went, the more success we had. It would have been, and this is a, probably an important point, it would have been a mistake to try to go after Capital One at the beginning because trying to sell to a large organization like that, there's a lot you don't want to learn through the process because it can take many months to close a deal like that. In selling to the early companies, while we were successful, we learned a lot of lessons very quickly about what worked and didn't work. And that meant by the time I worked my way up to these big companies, all that mattered, all that was left to learn was exactly how to sell to them. It wasn't how to should the product work and how should the experience work and all those sorts of other questions. Because I think... Nima, to your point, you don't want to conflate a lot of those things. Like how many lessons can you learn in a single experiment, right? Yeah. And all these things are experiments. So if I'm going into a sales process and I want to learn, how do I sell this? What's the right price? How should the product work? Like all those sorts of things, just too many things. You can't learn them all in a, in a single process. And so Special. we did benefit, even though it felt frustrating in the moment, having to like try to sell to certain kinds of companies and failing, inevitably it probably was a more effect, efficient path to, to the right fit for us. This, this feels like so correct for me because this is exactly how we felt. Like, I think we were not ready to sell to some of these bigger companies. Um, and I had attempted it before, right? We had like got into meetings where I was pitching like some way bigger companies than the average sort of client that we had. And we just didn't have the infrastructure. We didn't know mm -hmm. how to speak the language. They were looking for things that we just didn't have. There were parts of our organization that were just not set up to speak to them in a way that they expected. Uh, a, a large scale sort of growth agency or whatever to, to speak to them. So I, this like sounds super familiar to me where you kind of have to slowly climb up at least from mid to mid to enterprise, mid market to enterprise feels like a gradual. Yes, you learn about what, what pieces you're missing. You put it together and you go and then SAS, I'm sure it's all these like certifications for instance you have to have and all this sort of stuff when you're dealing with enterprise versus mid market it just makes a lot of sense, right? Um, mm-hmm. Ryan, how about you guys? I think you guys obviously started. I, a sorry, question for, yeah. I, I thought it'd be interesting. So, so Dan asked this question in the comments that Brian, I think it might be interesting for you to address, which is 
that's great. But how do you, which I think is really the great question of, of selling anything is how do you get meetings? What's uh, what, what do you, what do you have to say to that? Okay. So I am not the person to answer that question because our entire go to market strategy relies on the bottoms up and product led growth motion. So we, deliberately did not do sales uh, actually until last year. So this company had already been around for six and a half years until we started doing sales assist and then sales led. So for us, you know, it all depends on what I tell founders all the time when they're starting to think about how to build out their go to market. It really just depends on what type of products, you know, and what type of industry you're going after. So with Webflow, is you know fundamentally what Webflow is is we're trying to revolutionize or essentially trying to re reimagine the way software is developed, and we imagine that the best way to develop software is to do it visually, where a startup founder, a designer, even an engineer um, is much better served building their software visually. And we started on the front end, which no one was doing at the time. Everyone told us we were crazy. Everyone would say that this is not going to be as powerful as developers need, and this is too complicated for designers, but we kind of just stuck to it. And in order for us to see success, we had to create a groundswell effect. And that groundswell effect is essentially the foundation of our go-to-market back in 2013 as it is today. And what I mean by that is that we have to just go for broad, broad adoption. We have to prove to the world through word of mouth and the number of customers that we actually were building a product that people really needed and loved. And then it was only after probably we had a hundred thousand paying customers uh, <laughs> that we started to do sales. So was, yeah, what, what was the reasoning? Like, how come you decided to start doing any sales to begin with? Why not just like ride that out? Well, first off, like the company was already, well, actually, I'll, I'll rewind a little bit. Like the company, you know, had a rocky start, you know, it's several different near death experiences, got rejected by YC, coming out of YC the second time we applied, we barely, you know, scraped a seed round together. So essentially, we were extremely bootstrap focused because we just had so many near death experiences early in our company's history. So for us, it was all about getting to profitability. Mm. And getting to profitability meant that we weren't willing to invest heavily into sales and to have that J curve come out. So it was all about the high velocity self serve motion where we could easily, you know, let customers subscribe to whatever plan they needed. So for us, you know, that kind of like was a bit of scar tissue because, you know, we had been kind of so accustomed to this particular approach for so long. And it wasn't until I would say late 2019 um, that we just realized that we were getting pulled up market. Mm. What I mean by that is, is that customers would literally call our personal cell phones. I have no idea how, you know, prospects would find my phone <laughs> number. <laughs> this is amazing. I you was know, like, Brian, I really need an MSA. I really need you to fill out the security questionnaire. I really need you to do this. So what we did was we essentially just, you know, I plucked someone out from the customer support team. I was like, you've got a sales background, like just help me just like take some phone calls. And that's, that's how our sales um, kind of started from there is that we just were, people were just essentially begging us to, to have this type of motion. Is this, is this Brando, by the way, the person yeah. you put? Yeah, yeah. I just had a conversation with him because one of our clients is buying you guys. <laughs> That's such an interesting thing. Like, I, you know, you hear these stories about like, when you hit product market fit, for instance, there was this like pull effect. And when customers calling you, that's just, that's the epitome of it, right? Um, it makes so much sense. And that's the answer to the question. How do you get meetings? They, they, they just call you. It's really that simple. There you go. Growth in a, <laughs> you just have to spend the six or seven years before that building the business so that that, that happy becomes easy. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's totally circumstantial, right? Like it totally depends on what type of product you have and what type of company you ultimately want to build. Do you want to build a product first company or do you mm -hmm. want to build a sales led company? Yeah. I mean, just to, just well, to, yeah, actually, that's, sorry, a, that's an interesting question. I was going to say, it's an interesting question, Brian. I'm curious what you guys think, because 
sometimes having done this a few times, I often find myself wondering that companies that master their go-to-market strategy, is there, how much is luck an element there? Because you can't, you can't try every possible go-to-market strategy, right? It's just not possible. And so, you know, Brian, you mentioned how you got, you, you, you didn't go for the sales model because you had some scar tissue. Um, Flurry was the same way. There was, we, we came from a consumer background. So a freemium direct service model was what we knew. It turned out to be the right go-to-market motion, but I can't say that it was an exhaustive search of every option that got us there. Some way it was we, we were there be, for other reasons. So how much is, is finding it luck versus how much is science? I mean, if I could, if I could answer that question <laughs> without without guessing, I think that the <laughs> the thing is like this is what we do actually. You know, we we think that basically there is some intuition plus data that is like probably the answer because there's no not enough any any data available to tell you what what the right thing is. And um, one of the things we do for our team is when we try to come up with experiments, we essentially do a gut check where everyone kind of predicts things. It's like here's where the experiment's going to go. It's going to either win or lose or um, we're going to learn nothing. And we then look at what we do. This is like basically the, um, the hedge fund-esque model of trying to look at how good people are at, at sort of taking bets on things. And then over time, we, we tell you how good you are at betting on things. Um, and it turns out, hmm. and the data said, basically, most of the time it's a toss up. Like it's just most of the time. And, and these people who are spending millions of dollars on these things and they run experiments for a living, for growth. And it's most of the time a toss up. Uh, so, so much of it, I think, has mm. to do with what Brian mentioned, and maybe you have also, also went through the si similar process, which is finding where your product actually fits. And I call this sort of like product channel fit. It's like, there is this thing with my product. It works very well within this channel. That's why it's working. Not so much where, okay, I could have done it this way versus that way. It's actually like cohesive. And I may be wrong about this, but this is I, my theory. I actually feel like there's a, there's a calculus that a founder can make here that you put together the TAM, you put together what type of users, you know, can address that TAM, and then you kind of fit it into your distribution strategy. So, okay, let's just use the example. Mm -hmm. Like at Vungle, um, we had uh, an ad network. And for us, we knew that the TAM was big. So we wanted like anyone to download the SDK and install it so that they could monetize it. But we also knew that from a distribution angle, the vast majority of mobile apps and games that make money is in the short tail. It's in like the top 5% or even top 2% actually of mobile app developers make like 90% of the revenue or something like that. So we just knew that we had to have a sales motion, right? So I think it's like, actually, I don't know. I'm sure someone could like create a Google sheet for this or something like that. It was like, how big is your TAM, right? Like, what is your distribution look like? And what is like the, the curve, um, the distribution curve, your potential customer set? Same thing with Webflow. Like the TAM is huge. Websites is the largest software category in the world. The number of direct uh, service, a serviceable addressable market are at the time for us freelance web developers. We looked that up. Okay, let's just call it 500,000 uh, freelance web developers. We're like, that's pretty considerable TAM in, certain, in SAM. So let's just go with self serve and see how far it can go. So, like, I think any founder can probably run through that calculus to like kind of like get an understanding for how big their market is. But then you have to couple that with your distribution strategy. How are you actually going to go reach those people? Sometimes it's bottoms up self-serve or paid marketing. Sometimes it's outbound sales. What's interesting, the way you're talking about this is basically like you had a, some form of a solution in mind already where you're trying to think, okay, this is the solution. Here's what the potential market for the solution. And then now I can work backwards from how to reach that market with, with whatever distribution channel where I, it, it, it goes against like a lot of f like wisdom around, oh yeah, don't have a solution in mind in the beginning and go discover the problem first and, and go at it. I, and, and maybe this is like- different, yeah, right? especially yeah. at Webflow, it's, we take it, our product development philosophy is different in that sense is that we're not gonna incrementally get to the innovation that we 
at least as founders and as leaders want to see, right? Like mm-hmm. in 2013, no one said that they wanted Webflow when we explained mm-hmm. it to them. But we're just like, it should just exist. Like we have Adobe Premiere for video editing. We have Maya for 3D modeling. We have uh, your your digital um, studios, right? Like, uh, uh, what's, what, are, what are they called? Ableton, right? And okay, these are Ableton. all essentially uh, abstractions over this creative medium that people engage with every single day, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but none of that existed for the web, which is like the one medium that people interact with the most. So we're just like, mm-hmm. well, there's got to be a gap. Yeah. Oh, I think you're so. It, the reality is, any good idea is going to sound crazy at the time because if you're if it doesn't sound crazy, I don't think you're ahead of the market to arrive when you need it to. Right? If it's obvious to everybody, you might already be too late. I, that's every flurry and outlier. Everything I've done, people would look at at the beginning and say, like, that doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? There's other ideas that are much more logical, and that vision drives you to do something that other people don't realize. And then what happens is, you know, a few years later, they're like, wow, you're so visionary. And you're like, yeah, I thought, I feel like I was visionary the whole time, but you used to tell me I was crazy. What happened back then? <laughs> time, time heals all these things where people are like, oh man, I was so wrong about this company. Um, it always makes me feel like VCs have <laughs> well, such a hard, <laughs> hard job because of it. Cause they just see the innovation and they just can't understand it. So they pass on it. That's all right. Time. I, I tell founders, it's better for people to think you're crazy at the beginning and realize you're, you're visionary later, because often it's the other direction where people think at the beginning and then you're crazy later. So you want it to happen in that direction. So um, good. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, the next thing you know, I wanted to touch on a little bit, uh, you know, I come from like this word, I call it, you know, we, even internally, we call our people growth managers and the word growth is being used a lot more. And I feel that the SaaS industry, at least especially like enterprise SaaS, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but feels like it's still using the marketing term a lot, a lot more. Um, and maybe, maybe we could talk about what is the difference in your minds in this? Because I think I've heard so many different variations of this. You know, there was like this growth hacking term that was thrown around for like half a decade mm, earlier. Mm-hmm. And then now it's going towards like growth marketer so it's kind of mixing mixing in with marketer but then mm-hmm. some of them are under product roles like what 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 is like growth growth hack or growth mean to you i guess uh, in your organization do you even have people with those titles mm-hmm. that's a great qu- and, and honestly having done both consumer um the freemium lower price SaaS, and then um what we do now at outlier enterprise selling i have uh, it's changed and I've seen kind of all of them. And I'll tell you for me, let's start off with the marketing. There's different kinds of marketing. There is a performance marketing, which we call growth, where it's a lot about a quantitative approach to, I put this in out, what do I get out of it? How do I optimize my conversion rates? There is um, brand marketing where your goal isn't to drive an outcome. Your, your goal is to drive awareness. Do people know my brand? And that's going to be common for consumer products uh, like shoes or food, where they you may not go on a website to, well, these days you do, but in general, I might not go on a website to buy something, but I want when I walk into a store to be thinking about it as brand marketing. And then there's also what they call product marketing, which is how do you talk about your products? How, what language do you use? What messaging? How do you position yourself? Which is not performance. It's more around making sure you're in a position to use performance marketing because you have terms that you use, you have logic and marketing breaks down to all those different forms of it. I think that what happens in enterprise saw is that a lot of the other forms of marketing are as if not more important than performance marketing or growth. Whereas in the, in the other roles, especially in consumer, I think performance marketing or growth is probably the most important. And so why is it different enterprise versus consumer in a consumer world? You're not talking to your customers every day. A lot of it's about volume. It's about how many people you add. It has to be about the numbers and the economics of it. In the enterprise world, you know, there's a world where let's say we sell enterprise software. It's a million dollars a year, which is on the extreme of, of that you may only close a few deals a year. And what matters in those few deals is your relationship with that buyer and things like brand marketing and product marketing matter a lot because all you're trying to influence is one person or one group of people. I'm not trying to close millions of new users in my platform. 
So there's not a lot of performance marketing to be done because there may be, you know, a dozen buyers on my platform. They all fit in a spreadsheet. I can literally call and talk to them live. <laughs> a lot of it is the other forms of marketing that influence that decision. Whereas on the other end in consumer, it's about numbers. You have to get to volume. It's a race to volume because if you don't get to volume, nothing else ends up mattering and it becomes about performance. And I think that's why there's these different definitions is depending on where you are, there's this kind of sliding scale. This is kind of the model Brian was talking about. It, there's this model where like on one extreme is consumer, one extreme is enterprise. And based on where you are, the relative forms of marketing start to off play each other. I think that's my opinion, at least. Yeah. For, for, for growth roles at Webflow, there's actually three categories and now I'll, I'll explain how growth lives inside of our company right now. So the first pod is growth inside of the product org. So we're actually calling that pod, not growth product, but we're actually calling it user lifecycle. And for that team, uh, it's a growth product team. So there's designers, engineers, and product managers. They're in charge for all four stages of the user lifecycle. Um, acquisition, activation, monetization, and retention. So across those four stages, we have actual engineers and PMs working on that. And on the marketing side of the house, we also have growth marketers and they supplement the growth product teams with also acquisition work. But one thing that they layer on on top is awareness. So now essentially we have like one, two, three, four, five different stages of the life cycle with marketing owning awareness with blend on activation and then growth product or, or life cycle team owning those four stages and uh, uh, acquisition. So that's like our growth people as like a sub tree below growth marketing that lives in marketing still are our demand uh, gen marketers. So these are um, user acquisition focused that are specifically meant to service our sales teams and to acquire leads and generate leads for our sales teams. So there's actually, when we talk about growth at Webflow, you've got PMs, designers, engineers on the self-serve side, you've got growth marketers, but then you also have demand gen. So there's actually like five different roles in growth um, at Webflow that are all kind of loosely correlated doing the same thing. And what we try to do at the company is we will really try to make sure that the teams are all swimming in the same direction and then also drafting off of each other. And what I mean by drafting off of each other is that if the content team that's working on a blog post uh, is meant to you know, talk about a particular use case, the demand gen person is gonna make sure to extract you know, elements of that so that they can take you know, some, mm. something that they can bring to leads or for the lead gen. But um, at the root of it, uh, we, we are quite intentional about focusing our, our, our life cycle teams. So for example, on a quarter basis, we'll say only work, at, only work on activation. That's the mm. lowest kind of fruit. Uh, next quarter, it could still be that. It's just, we still feel like this is the highest leverage thing. So we're going to continue working on activation. Over time, however, we expect just like other companies have done, like Dropbox, Slack, uh, Atlassian, to, to staff full-time teams focused on specific parts of the user lifecycle. So right now we're spinning up another team on acquisition. And this acquisition team is gonna be really working hand in hand with our community team, with content team, just to really make sure we have a really healthy top of funnel and that our product can really facilitate those signups from the right uh, customer segments that we want. Yeah, this I mean, f seems super familiar because it's I think very popular in consumer, right? Um, the, the question I have for you, and this is always, um, I'm, I think I've seen it happen differently, is who's like looking at the economics of the whole thing? Because now you have these silo teams who are given these like metrics to, to sort of win at. It's like, oh, I need to retain more people. I need to get more people in. Uh, who's looking at the holistic picture of dollars in, dollars out of this game? Is it is it the growth people or is everyone sort of reporting on that metric together? Is it you? That's what you're looking at every, every day? Like who is in charge of the economics of the business? At least at Webflow, um, it's a variety of people, and 
At the end of the day, we have different functional leaders that will own different KPIs. So, you know, our, our head of growth will own the activation mm -hmm. metric because that's the only person, that's the only thing that that team is working on. Our can you, by the way, just describe what activation means? Just so yeah, in case sorry, it means stuff. post sign up, the percentage of users that, you know, activate uh, in Webflow. And for us, it's uh, users that build a website that have at least 10 visits. That's our like North Star metric. Mm. Um, so like for Airbnb, it could be, you know, guests completing a booking for, you know, Dropbox, it could be number of files synced, but that, that was what, you know, we worked with our data science team to essentially come up with our North Star metric. Um, so it just depends on what part of the, you know, funnel, you know, we try to be really uh, clear about who's holding what torch. So we'll have you know one person to own conversion. We'll have one person to own the raw signup numbers, which is the growth marketing team, and then we'll have people watching you know certain KPIs such as churn rates and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you know I hope to build a culture where everyone is looking at our Tableau dashboards, where they can see like all of our top line metrics, and they can you know have a really good pulse of the business. Hmm. Yeah, that makes it, a lot of it sense. It actually brings up a good thought for me too, which is one of the other reasons that I think that the growth model you're describing doesn't work as well in enterprise is that, you know, the enterprise sales cycle can be, I don't know, if you're selling to banks, it can be measured in years. And so there's less of a feedback loop you can build in as part of a growth performance mindset. Whereas obviously if you're transactional and you're to drive a behavior and in the same session or in this um, it's a very different kind of model where um, it's less high touch. It's more about those sorts of things. It's probably also a factor in the different levels of it as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, what's interesting is this activation thing made me think that you know, not to, not to scare you scare you about this model model of growth, but um, I remember the I don't know if you guys remember that company Tilt. They were doing these like sort of um, you know crowdfunding mm -hmm. things for a while and. I spoke to a bunch of growth people. This is like four years ago now. And because they were given such like hard numbers, you have to have these many activations, et cetera. They were like getting their friends to go home and like tilt, tilt jobs. And like, that's obviously not sustainable, but you know, the mm -hmm. day before the month was over because they were being judged in these numbers, they're basically faking the numbers in, in, in a way. Uh, but what's, what's cool about maybe the, the activation sort of rule that you've set is that it's very hard to fake that. Like people have to build a website mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there's like 10 people have to visit it. So I think that, the choice on what that like activation moment is in a product like that seems to be extremely important um, because there's people game it, even, even though it's your team that you're trusting to mm -hmm. grow, grow, it, grow the product for you. They, um, they don't want to lose. They're, they're so obsessed with winning this game, right? Um, that you, you created for them. So mm -hmm. it's, it's something to, and it always scares me with, with incentive models around. Uh, growth, yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. I think it's a, it's a good inspiring model because I, I think the best metrics of growth and just in general are, are these second degree metrics, things you can't easily game. So, you know, do you want to give a salesperson incentive of how many meetings they have or how much revenue that they close, right? Revenue, because at the end of the day, they can't force somebody to sign a piece of paper and, and buy your product. But you know what? You can set up meetings just for the sake of setting up meetings. And those kind of second order things are harder to game and they, they drive more fundamentals. Um, I agree a thousand percent. That's a good way to think about it. it actually, Brian, how did you come across that, that North Star? Because these sorts of things aren't always obvious with different kinds of products. And it is so important to choose it. I'd be curious to hear how you came about that website with 10 visits. Yeah, I can say that it's the perfect metric for us because it's not like inclusive of all of Webflow's use cases that we want to capture in this activation metric in Star. But, um, you know, it started with just like a very qualitative narrative, right? Like we wanted to be able to come up with a metric that, you know, when we tell it to people, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. So the thought process is let's construct a story for a large swath of our customers where that if the story like pans out for our customers, that's like a success moment. So for us, like we think about, all right, well, people come to Webflow, they probably have an idea for what Webflow will do for them. They're going to build a website. And what does that website ultimately need to do? That website ultimately needs to, at the root of it, is to get visitors, get eyeballs, right? So like, why else would you build a website? Um, 
So we thought, we was like, all right, let's look at our data, which actually required us to instrument, you know, things that we've never instrumented before, such as like bandwidth, traffic, user agent detection. And we essentially built this data warehouse and all the backend models and all the jobs to be able to give us real-time queries that can give us this type of insight. We built a distribution curve and then we mapped that distribution curve for the number of users that got certain amount of visits to other downstream metrics, such as upgrading to a paid plan, such as retention, such as um, at, like you know, thirty-day you know product usage re retention curves, revenue retention curves. So then we were able to say it was like essentially pull the sweet spot down to ten visits. And that 10 visits had high correlation with paid upgrades, it had a high correlation with customer retention, and then also revenue retention. So we just knew that that was a really sol solid leading indicator for all of the other lagging indicators that we ultimately want in the business. So I think it's important for founders and operators, especially at growth stage businesses, to like make this distinction between leading indicators and lagging indicators. Mm -hmm. For us, like leading indicators was what we actually want to optimize around. We can't optimize around conversion rates. We can't optimize around lowering churn, but if we can optimize around one that actually A, tells the right story, qual, but then B, has the right quants to support the lagging indicators, then that's something that we can optimize our teams or growth teams around. That's a, uh, honestly, that's a fantastic point. I think you're right. We get so obsessed with things like revenue. A lot of people think that Revenue is the right metric, but often revenue is a, a lagging indicator because after, the revenue happens after the customer has made a decision. You want some leading indicators about how likely they are to make that decision and that it's a big mental shift to do that. It's a very good point. How do you guys do that, Sean? I think it's in the in Brian's case, there's all this data that you can look at, right? So in the in the enterprise SaaS world, um, obviously there isn't a lot of you. You talk to 10 people, one of them closes, you're actually having a great quarter. Um, how, how do you guys think about these types of things? Yeah, yeah it's the, that's the big difference. It, well, it was similar to Brian in that we create a narrative of what the customer experience should be like. Mm -hmm. It's less quantitative in that, to your point, there's fewer data points, but it's similar in thinking about that. So for us, a lot of what I realized early on was that if I go to you and I explain, we have this platform that uses AI to analyze your data, mm -hmm. what is your first reaction? It's going to be skepticism. You're like, there's no way software can do that. It sounds like magic. And so that what's the next thing reaction. we have to do? We have to be able to. <laughs> <Put it. Yeah. laughs> and so that, what do we have to do? We have to, we have to be able to prove it to you. And you don't prove things through demos. You prove things through actions. And so we had to build a product so that you could try it immediately, try it very quickly and see it working. You don't have to take my word for it. You can see that happening. And you kind of build up that narrative and you start to realize that for us, a lot of the key aspect of the whole process was offering like a two week trial, free trial of Outlier to see it working on your data. Um, because A, it's very fast, meaning that if you're interested, you can see it working. But also if you're, if you're willing to put your data in, there's an opening in that skepticism you have. There are some people that are so, so skeptical, they won't try anything. And of course, there's nothing you can do if somebody won't open the door for you. But if you can see that door open, um, we found that, that works really well. And what we found is people who want very long trials, they want like six month long trials. The the interest is maybe not as as acute or not as, um, it, as someone who's like two weeks, three weeks, because in two or three weeks, what we found is you can learn everything you need to know about the platform. You can use it, you can enjoy it, you can see all the, the advantages to it. Um, if you start drawing it out, are you as serious about needing the product? Are you serious about the pain point that you have there? And so we have similar things, I think, and we arrive them in similar ways. They're just less quantitative because the distribution, there's a distribution, but it's a very wide, it's got a very high variance because, mm -hmm. you know, you have one customer that you close a deal in, you know, 20 days and when you close in 45 days and another that you close in four months and all of a sudden the, the variance is very wide and, there's also so many factors in an enterprise deal that it's not always clear what the single or handful of key factors that led to the result are. Um, and so you have to be very narrative driven in your hypothesis and testing. Yeah, that definitely resonates with me. I think it's also like with enterprise sales, it's not just the person that's using the software that's involved. So there's all these slew of other people that are involved. So maybe we could um, 
talk about, I mean, I also want to ask you about the fact that you just hired a CMO and how you, what you went through that thought, but we can, we can pocket that. I'd love to hear, um, and maybe Brian, you guys are going enterprise as well. So this is going to be probably relevant to both of you is how do you guys think about the other people? There is just, there's like the user of your product, clearly, you know, they go and get the value out of it. Mm -hmm. But then there is a people who pay for it. There's people who are involved, maybe like they're analysts on it or like they're part-time users of it, all this sort of stuff. How do you distinguish between them? How did you get to that? Uh, in your in your sales process as you learned about the organizations that you were selling into love to hear about that we we treat the primary users and everything we do for them as innovation and then everything we do for the other stakeholders as optimization so the reason why i say that is what we're actually trying to do at webflow is we're actually trying to make this visual developer we call like superhuman right so now one visual developer in Webflow can build something that teams of designers and developers used to take three months to do, but now you could just do it with one person in Webflow, right? So that's innovation for us. Like we're pushing the boundaries of what our software can do. And then that's also not something that anyone else can do. When it comes to like the table stakes features of selling into the enterprise, like SSO, roles and permissions, audit logs, security uh, tags, um, records retention, right? Like those are not going to really change the game in terms of like how it's going to progress the vision of your company forward, but it's important for your go to market. So then the thing for us that we constantly struggle with is like, what is the right investment of Mount? And then also what is the right timing to go do some of the optimizations that's necessary for the go-to-market? I like that a lot. I, I feel like it, you, it sounds like you think in metaphors a lot and in and, and, and stories, because even, even when the way you talked about the, the growth team and how they swim together, um, uh, and that was, that was interesting. I, I generally like these types of approaches with management, actually. So this makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I don't I'm know sure. where I picked that up from, honestly. Yeah. Like, I just, I just, I think I'm a very, very visual person. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't process things very well, like audibly. So, like, I always like think my logic out. So then, in order to like, mm -hmm. like, describe what I'm thinking, I have to use real world examples. Like, for example, today I was, I was talking about you know, climbing half dome as a, as a metaphor to software development for this one really hard feature we're trying to do. So like, I'm constantly thinking of metaphors. I, I just realized that. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I think it actually helps people understand what you're talking about better. It's really super useful. Um, Sean, what mm -hmm. about you guys? I think you, I would assume you, you're selling into quite complicated organizations given, given your products. So, uh, I, I'm sure many different parts of a, a company can use your product, oh. right? So, <laughs> and, and I actually think Brian's point about optimization and innovation is a really good one. And it's important to remember that incumbent, the larger companies have an advantage in that they've already made that investment in a lot of those table stakes. And so the challenge we have as new companies is we can invest a lot of innovation, but if they already have those table stakes, we have to essentially play catch up. And if we don't get that balance, the danger of not getting that balance right is, we have a lot of innovation, but we can't sell. We like the table stakes or we invest a lot in the table stakes and we're not differentiated because they already had them and we're just essentially duplicating. And that's, that's a really hard part of, of most software platforms. And in that balance, I think is the difference between really products that continue to velocity and products that kind of stall out at some point is they don't get that balance quite right. And I think it's a good way of framing it. Um, for us, I, I think the biggest mistake I've seen people make, and this is what I've tried to avoid is that they, the customer journey or the customer experience is a byproduct of how they've organized their company. And so, for example, you have the growth team over here, they try to acquire leads. And once they find a lead, they throw it over the fence. And, you know, I don't know, your SDR team picks it up. And then the SDR team develops a lead, they throw it over the fence to sales. And what ends up happening is then your customer journey is very disjointed because it's an artifact of how you set up your teams. Whereas really what you want is there's only one customer. They see one journey. They don't care how you're organized as a company. So the questions of being, how can you best architect that journey so it isn't an artifact of how you organize? And they don't care if you have a growth team over here and an SDR team here and, and those sorts of things. I'll give you an example of how we think about it. We actually have our customer success team run the trials. 
And we do that because I want to know that the customer in the trial, when they're happy and they continue and they sign a contract, become a customer, I don't want there to be a handoff where they're now thrown to somebody else, that you have mm-hmm. this weird rotating list of people that the person that you liked that you got up with the product with is the same person you'll work with all the way through. But that's not how most companies think about it. And I think it requires a lot of it requires a lot of empathy to the customer to design something that's more in line with their expectations and that empathy. And it's also why I like, I also speak in metaphors a lot. So we'd be of that in common, right? Is I find that that helps breed empathy because it's, it's, you start to think about it. If you're the customer, what do you see? How do we get into their shoes? And let's be honest, if you're in a growth stage company, there's things happening all over the place. There's lots of distractions. You can get lost in your own world easily. And, and, rising above it and putting yourself back in that customer seat is such a superpower and organizations that are really good at that. I think it's just, it comes through in the fact that they just keep growing and the ones that struggle with that empathy or they lose track of it and they get so lost in the side baseball of how they operate, they start to stall out. And so I try to go to great lengths and make sure we don't lose that. And, but the answer changed the right formula today might be different in a year when we're twice the size, it might be different in two years. And so it's constantly moving target. Yeah, I think that that resonates a lot because one of the things that I, I truly believe in is is organizational design has a lot to do with growth. Like the way you've designed how people report to each other and how they communicate internally uh, has a lot to do with how fast you grow. And I think you just hit it on the nose where this customer success person that you're already dealing with is not going to be with you along your journey as, as a customer. That is huge, actually. It's like very rare to see in SaaS um, where you, you basically walk through three people usually either one is behind the scenes you don't see it in the marketer that brings you in and then there is like an sdr that talks to you then an ae talks to you then a customer success manager now there's like three handoffs before you've started working with the product um it just makes no sense and and i always have this this argument with with SaaS founders where i just don't agree that that's the model um but it's just become such a norm in the industry for some reason. Uh, and it makes no, like empathetically speaking, it makes no sense, right? Uh, like if you've been on mm-hmm. the buyer side, it sucks to be part of that. It's like now I have to be awkwardly meeting a new person three times within like a one week period just to use this software um, that I'm paying like $2,000 a month mm-hmm. for. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, we can get more into this. It's one of the things that I think is ridiculous about the, the SaaS industry <laughs> I think in general. Um, but maybe we can we can touch on it in this way, which is, um, you know, I think probably organizations deal with this differently, but I hear this a lot, quite often, where a VP marketing comes to us and says, the VP sales is upset because they think the leads that we're getting them are just not good enough or high quality enough. And I hear the exact opposite where, you know, the um, VP marketing says, you know what, the sales team is bad. We send them great leads and they're just not closing them enough. Um, <laughs> How, how do you, how do you, I, I mean, it's such a weird like org design problem. It's basically purely an org design problem in my opinion, but I'd love to hear what you think of that. Cause I'm sure you've dealt with something similar along these lines before where so, some team is bringing the people you want to close and they're, they're upset about it. I, I will say that you're right. That tension I mean, exists. I don't think that it's an org design problem. It's a natural tension of incentives. If you have people who want to achieve you, you, you see a lot of things and you're going to have that tension. The question is, is it healthy or unhealthy, right? Is, is sales eager for more leads because they know they can sell more? Are they blaming marketing for why they're not hitting their number? Those are two different things. Mm-hmm. Is marketing frustrated that they're doing all this work and the message is being lost, that the personas they're bringing in aren't being, there, there's some sort of discontinuous in the message or are they just frustrated that they're bringing all these leads and they're not going anywhere? They don't want to take ownership of the problem. Those are different. I think sources of tension, mm-hmm. you're going to have tension. The question is, can you make sure it's positive and healthy? And the easiest way to figure that out is, are the teams working well together despite the tension? If they are really working together, it probably is very positive. And if they're struggling to work together, it's probably not very positive. And that ends up being the distinction of a well-functioning organization, in my opinion, because you're never getting rid of that tension. But it's also like, you think about incentives, it, these things get exacerbated. Let me put it this way. I think product market fit is a lot of definitions. I think the best definition I have, which is that product market fit is the company survives your mistakes. And so the, the stronger your product market fit, the more mistakes you can make and the company will still survive. And the worse one. your product market fit, the more that these things probably come up. 
right? So the more of this friction gets unhealthy if your product market fit isn't as strong. And if it's really strong, nobody cares because things are just cranking and you just, just things take off. And it's always a spectrum, but it's not a destination. Product market fit can grow, it can wane. It's, it's not like you get there and you're there and you just lean back and relax. It's a constant battle. But where you are at any given point along that spectrum influences that tension a lot as well, I think, because, you know, people, uh, people, when things are going really well, people want them to go even better. When things are going badly, they want to turn them around. And you have two different versions of that. I love that singing. And I think that described Webflow really, really well because we've made a lot of mistakes. And somehow we just keep growing. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, which which gives me the utmost confidence that once we write those mistakes, then I think uh, you know we're, we're, we'll be in a much better spot. But I, I love that quote. What is the conventional saying? Is that growth solves all, all problems? Um, it seems like one of those things where it's like, okay, if you're growing and that the reason for that is product market fit, then you, you get to make a lot of mistakes along along the way. And, and I love that. That's, that makes so much sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, so uh, I do want to ask you about how you, and, and maybe Brian, I'd love to hear about how the sort of progression of the team team worked a little bit, because you, you now like have this like super well-fledged fledged out uh, system of people working on growth. And, and Sean, you just hired a CMO to take over. And I'm assuming you, you've you been kind of running marketing so far yourself. Um, how did that decision come to me? I mean, Sean, you can start on, uh, you decided that it's time for a CMO. What does that mean? What was the logic that went behind it's time to bring someone on to completely lead this part of the organization. Well, so to be clear, before we hired the CMO, we actually had a VP of marketing. We still have a VP of marketing. She's fantastic. Um, I'm not a great marketer. And so I think one of the best things you can do early on is recognize what you're not good at and find people that are good at that and bring them in. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a difference between the things that you think you're good at and the things that you actually are good at. And telling the difference between those two things is another superpower that's often hard to, to get a handle on. So I can tell you I'm not a great marketer. I'm probably okay at product marketing in terms of finding ways to describe what we do, but a lot of the other parts of marketing are not a strength of mine. And I think, why did we decide to bring a CMO in? I th it might be somewhat unique to venture back businesses, but uh, let's summarize a successful venture back business has, no matter what you're doing, consumer enterprise has one very important thing in common across the board, which is you grow faster, the bigger you get. And the vast majority of businesses don't do that. They grow more slowly, the bigger they get. And if you're gonna grow faster, the bigger you are, you're defying the natural order of business, which is to slow down. And it doesn't happen by accident. I don't think you just wake up one day and you've accidentally found a way to triple and at scale. And so at some point you have to have experience in seeing that movie and understanding what's necessary to be done farther and farther in advance. So the bigger the company gets, the farther in advance you have to take action. So in the early days, you know, you're doing a day to day or week to week, you're making changes, you're iterating. As a company gets bigger, you're making changes, then you get to scale. There's a point at which you're, you're working on things that will have impact in six months or in a year, just because the numbers get so big, you can't, you know, in the early days in enterprise, for example, you're right, you could close a single deal and that can make your quarter. And then you get to a point where it takes five deals and then it takes 10 and all of a sudden it's 20. And there's a point where you, you can't just hustle and find those deals. You have to have done the work six months, nine months ahead of time to make sure you have those deals to hit those numbers. And so for me, there's a, you need people who have seen that progression and can build that engine and anticipate those problems. And that was what uh, led to us bringing in Mike Stone as our new CMO was, was looking for somebody who had that experience. And it doesn't, it doesn't in any way take away from the marketers on our team who are very good. I see it. I saw it more as what can we do for the existing team to make them more successful as we scale and bringing in that experience and that anticipation of what we needed was a big part of it. And so um, I didn't see it as we were lacking something in the team. It was need to be different in a year and two years and three years. And the best way to get there is to anticipate. That's an interesting one. So you thought you'd bring in someone who's like seen, and I think you put it as you've seen that movie play out. And that was, that mm -hmm. was sort of the, the thinking. I love it. Oh, cause like going back to this thing about growing faster, the bigger you are, imagine there's, there's a point where no matter how strong your product market fit is, if you start to lose momentum, cause you start tripping over yourself, that it's really hard. It gets harder and harder to reclaim it at scale. And you see it all the time with these companies that get to a certain point, they start tripping up and then they have to try to reclaim that momentum. 
And the best way to not trip over yourself is to know where all those places that you might trip are hiding. Like I'll, enterprise software, let me give you another example. Your growth at some point in the early days is mostly based on you know, how fast can you get customers into your lead generation funnel. Mm -hmm. But there's a point where it transitions and all of a sudden your revenue is more dependent on how fast you can hire account executives and ramp them up. And it's a very subtle switch because at some point you can get enough leads, but there's not enough salespeople to service them, to close them if you can't ramp up the AEs fast enough. And the difference between say a six month ramp time and a three month ramp time is a lot in terms of how fast you can grow the business. And if you don't anticipate when you're gonna make that shift and it happen to you, you end up being behind the eight ball where you have either more leads than you can service or you don't, you can't bring people on fast enough because your team doesn't have time to hire, to interview to hire the salespeople you need to bring on board. So anticipation is a big part of not losing that momentum. Yeah, I, I, I'm extremely familiar with this problem. We deal with it a lot uh, in other companies where they were just not prepared for the growth. And, and we actually dealt with it in our own company last year, where we were just not able to grow fast enough. And the headcount problem is such a hard one to solve because you ruin culture if you overdo it and speed it up. So it's a it's an intricate problem that I think is not at all spoken in the context of growth, but it's a huge part of how you grow companies very fast. And, and I've learned this like the hardest ways that I'd say both for our clients and, and our own company. Um, anyway, Brian, uh, you, were, you were about to say something. Yeah, yeah I'm, I think like when I'm thinking about like the progression of the org, growth org, marketing org is that we, um, started out really slow growing our marketing team because we just we didn't really know or i didn't really know like what steps or what triggers the pool um so it's honestly my own naivete like around like i just didn't even know like what i should be doing um i knew that you know we should probably write a blog and we should probably do some thought <laughs> thought leadership right and so it was just like okay let's just try all these random things and see what sticks um what eventually worked for us was we started the blog but we started leaning really heavily on our product launches as our primary mechanism for growth so we just saw that every single time we shipped a new product there was just like like excitement and energy on hacker news on Reddit forums, and we just like really leaned into that. So what, you know, the first, one of the first hires that I made, first two hires that I made was just a really, really good brand designer and a, and a, and a really, really good product marketer, like someone that could tell the story. So with every new feature that we did, we just went gangbusters. We we're just like, what is the most like ridiculous thing that we could do with this product launch? So for example, you know, for the web, developers or web designers or Webflow users out there, we have this feature called Flexbox. So when we launched Flexbox, we literally built a game around this feature. And it was 27 levels and you had to use our <laughs> UI to progress through this game. And it blew up on Hacker News. It was number one on Hacker News. It generated 15,000 signups over the course of like three days. And People loved it. It exposed people to the product and um, exposed people to the brand. So that had been our strategy for a while, actually. And we, we rinsed and re repeated that for a, some amount of time. But now like that I think about you know, the marketing org, it's a lot more traditional looking. So we'll have product marketing, we'll have demand gen, we'll have growth marketing, we'll have content community. Um, and then also uh, Ashley, our VP of marketing, she's great about thinking about um, integrated marketing as this new function, which I'd never heard of. So integrated marketing, uh, for those that don't know, is essentially this role where their main job is to look at all the different marketing initiatives that are happening and make sure that together the sum of all parts is, is greater than what it is. And for us, that's exactly what we needed because we have community efforts, we have content efforts, we have all these different things that when added up is much larger than it actually seems. So the, the progression of the org was definitely uh, a, a progression more of like my own internal understanding for what marketing could actually do. Mm -hmm. okay. 
that that sounds familiar. <laughs> um, it, it's crazy. Like, you know, when you found the company, you just don't know a lot about these things and, and you can't afford to hire the people who've already done it three times. So you kind of have to discover these things by yourself as you, as you go. And but I also get didn't to like change. optimize for that. I, I didn't mm -hmm. optimize for people that had done it like two, three times, because at least for us, the way I look at it and it's the way I still look at it is that no one's ever built Webflow before. No one's ever built our product before. No one's ever built our community mm -hmm. before. So it's all going to require a lot of original thinking. But where experience does help is in terms of like having the right frameworks, having the right scoring rubrics to help you operationalize how to go out and be creative as a marketer. Because marketers have to be creative. They have to generate noise. They have to like, like catch eyeballs. And for that, that's where like I index really heavily on like original thinking in, in marketers. I think that's so true. I'll actually take a step farther. I think that there's, there's a reason why marketing teams end up typically looking the same at scale is there's a point where just to hit the kind of volumes you get to, there's a kind of conventions, but those first few growth strategies, they're all unique. I mean, like your game example is a great one. I'll tell you what outlier, what got our started was I had a theory that so many of these companies that help you with data, they're very pedantic and condescending. They tell you, listen, your business is complicated. You don't understand it. You have to pay us a bunch of money and then we'll help you understand what's going on. And I'm like, that's, that's kind of weird. What if we change the voice? What if we change from being this professor that's lecturing you on what dashboard you need to like your best friend helping their homework? Somebody who's just there saying, listen, you're smart. You just need a little bit of coaching and you'll be there. You'll be able to make these decisions. Like what would it mean to change that voice? And so we launched a newsletter called the Data Driven Daily, which was a daily newsletter. This was, I don't know, years ago, back before newsletters are so hot. Again, visionary before my time. Look at that. <laughs> Uh, and we launched it, it to, you know, similar to your story, Brian, it blew up. We had thousands of subscribers. A lot of our first customers came through that newsletter, but it was, I mean, it wasn't an obvious thing that that would work. Like it's a very subtle thing to change just the voice you're using, if you think about it. And it's not the kind of thing, if you're a marketer with a lot of traditional marketing experience would make a lot of sense. But if you are really empathetic customer to innovate, it's the kind of thing that can really drive results. And so those first few growth strategies, it's, they're always unique and they're always interesting. And it's, it, it just goes to show you how creative you have to be in those early days to make things work. Yeah, I think that's, that, that point is well taken. I think I, I have so many of these random stories of how we've like acquired customers. I, I, you know, I've been in the startup world for a decade now. So I, I've, uh, a, a fun example I have on this one is we, we literally had people, I mean, including myself, stand outside of subways and then hand out flyers to people to, to install an app at some point. You know, there's there's crazy stuff that you do in the beginning to make, make things work. And, and then some of them are never repeatable, um, but they work for what you need at that point, the time in the history of the company, right? And, and take you to the next stage. Um, and it's just what you do to, to, to get, get to that stage. So then you can maybe come up with more operationalized versions of, of what you had come up with. Um, the, Brian, I, I, I hope if you can find it, if it's available, I'd love to send the game to people um, that you guys have built. Like I'd love to also play it because uh, we're big users of Webflow. Oh, you're, you're muted, by the way. I oh, just uh, dropped crazy. it in the chat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's awesome. hope it still works and is functional. Like we've updated our UI so that uh, it could look a little bit differently, but let me just, I don't know if I could share my screen. Well, I don't know. I won't no, share my screen. You could, you could check it out. Yeah. Um, you can play around with it. And, and <laughs> let me know if you get all the way through all the levels. There's 28 of them. The last one's pretty hard. So uh, if you end up getting it, uh, shoot me an email at brian at webflow.com and I'll give you a free year of Webflow Professional, which is like $500 a year off, so. Not very incentivized to win this game. <laughs> Do you see that? That was marketing, everybody. That, that's, that's a growth strategy right there. Well done. Um, Great. Well, thank you so much for doing this, guys. It was it was incredibly helpful, at least for me, to hear your stories and how you've gone here. Um, you know, we're big fans of both of your products, and uh, hope to have you again on this podcast. Thanks a lot.